tree to the side of the road until you get to the waterfall. And the waterfall is so beautiful. It comes down on the side of the mountain there, and it sparkles in the sunshine, you know, and the trees form a backdrop against it. It's so beautiful, so wonderful to look at. Again, when you sit, it catches your breath, it takes your breath away, it's so gorgeous. I just want you to join with me and, and walk along some of the streets we have in, in, in London and elsewhere, and we see a statue. And the statue looks as if it's real. The person looks as if he's about to speak. In fact, even the crease on his trousers and even the, 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 the actual folds in the, in the arm of his, of his jacket appear real. The person looks absolutely stunning. And you just pause and you think, that's a beautiful statue. And if you look at the, the pictures, that's a beautiful picture. And the scenery in, in the mountains, you think, that's just so wonderful. That's so wonderful. And then you just think, I can love this. I love that picture. I love that, that, that scenery in the mountain. I love that waterfall. I love the painting I see. I love the statue. But there's a problem. It's not love. It's not love. It's admiration. It's not love. Because you can admire those things, but they can't love you back. Mm -hmm. yeah? They can't love you back. God said in the second commandment not to actually make any, any images of, 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 of things on earth or on the heaven, in the heavens. Can we read Exodus 20 verses 46, please? <coughs> Exodus 20 verses 46. Can the volunteers just please just read that? says to us, don't make an image of him. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Don't make an image of him. So why did God say that we shouldn't make any images of him? Why did God say that? Because he's the God of jealous. God is jealous. Why would he be jealous? Now, you're, you're a woman. Why would you be jealous of the woman regarding all that? I love, because I love him. You love him? Yeah. Okay. But you're not just because you love him. You love him you're just because somebody else wants to love him as well. Yeah? That's why you're jealous. You're jealous because somebody else wants to take your affections that you receive from him away. Yeah? And quite rightly so. And so God says that he's jealous because these images may take away the affections you should have for me to them. Yeah? But it's more than that. Because he already made an image. Exactly. Which is you and me. Exactly. Yeah. He's already made an image. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Again, can you just read that? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God 
and to live in peace with him. Because God already has an image. He's created his image in us. We are to reflect the image of God. The problem is, sin has now deformed that image. As the ripples in the lake deform the image of reflecting as well, so we are also deformed from the image that God put in us initially. So if sin has distorted the image of God, then how can we know the true image? And how can we reflect the true image of God? Let's pray. Father, we want to praise you and thank you for making us in your image. And Father, I do pray that your gracious mercy will rest upon us. May you indeed lead us, Father, to the place where we can, Lord, share you faithfully. And may your grace rest upon us. And I pray that you be with me in a very special way as we share this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So how can we tell what the true image of God is? Well, you know, Ellen White in the Acts of the Apostles, page 273, said, The Apostle Paul saw that the character of Christ must be understood before men could love him or view the cross with the eye of faith. He must be given a study, that which shall be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In the light of the cross alone can the true value of the human soul be estimated. So there, Ellen Rice says that the law, the law is a reflection of the character of Christ. That Christ was understood before men could love him or view the cross, or view the cross of the hour of faith. In other words, only by approximating the character of Christ in the lives of his followers can the image of Christ really be displayed. Now, if we try and talk about God's physical features, it makes no sense, because God is spirit. He may have two hands, he may have two arms, he may have two legs, he may have a head, we don't know, but God is spirit. However, when we go back to the immediate context of Genesis chapter 1, it's about creation, it's about sustainment, it's about God giving authority. So the Lordship over the creatures has been juxtaposed with the image of God. So therefore, the authority over God's creatures captures an essence of God's image because God has that authority by virtue of being created. In other words, how we actually treat God's creation, how we treat God's creatures, reflects the image of God in us. The problem is that we haven't done a very good job of this, have we? No, it's not, it's not a good job at all. If we, if we were to reflect God's image over how we treat those creatures, then how do we reflect when we start eating those creatures? You know what? Do you follow me? I'm not saying we shouldn't eat them. What I'm saying is that how does that image of God reflect through us when we start eating those, those creatures? Let me, ask you, let me ask you a question. What would you think of a ruler who started eating those he or she has authority over? What if the, you know, we talked about going to Daniel's show. What if we went to visit the queen? We went to visit the queen, and you know, the queen started eating those people who were visiting her. How would we feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> scary. Yeah, exactly. Scary eating. Now, eating meat came about in the first place because of the effects of sin. So, our lordship over God's creatures is now a poor example, a poor reflection of God's image because of those ripples caused by sin. Ellen White's also desire of ages, page 69, says that the law of God is an expression of his character, and that as we receive the principles of the law into the heart, the image of God will be traced upon our mind and our soul. Therefore, a being 
this law of God is the essential element of reflecting the character of God. So let me ask you a question. Is keeping the law of God sufficient to reveal the full character of Christ? It should be, but unfortunately it's not. If it was, all we have to do is be very careful not to break any of God's commandments. However, that is virtually impossible. We can try to keep the first nine commandments and then fail at the tenth, because the first nine are about behaviour. The tenth is about our thoughts, our attitude, our inner self. Now, which one of us hasn't struggled with our thoughts at one time or another? I think we all have. Obeying the law of God is much more than behaviour. It also involves our attitude. For example, uh, when King David saw Bathsheba and he took her to himself, at that time he revealed himself to be an adulterer, a murderer and a thief. And yet, he was called by God as a man after his own heart. So obedience to the law of God is not sufficient. There's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. King David's life reveals that when we become aware of the sin in our lives, we should immediately have a genuine, heartfelt repentance for the wrong that we have done. Remember, David actually prostrated himself on the ground and prayed to God. How many times have we done that? In other words, it's not just keeping God's law that reveals his character, it's how we obey that law. Now, I know some, and we probably all know some, very legalistic Christians, don't we? And, and if, if that's the, the character of Christ being revealed in them, then it's terrible. It's terrible. They're harsh, they're bitter, they have no love in their hearts, they're very legalistic for the law of Christ. If we want to, to reflect the image of God, then we really ought to have the knowledge of God within us. In other words, we've got to know God, uh, who, what, who God is, what he is really like, and get to know God personally. The only place where that's revealed is in the Bible. We have to study God, what the God is statements in the Bible, that describe his character. Not the God is with you statements, because I don't say it's God's with you, but the God is. For example, 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 9 says, God is gracious and merciful. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength. Psalm 54 verse 4 says, God is our helper. Psalm 99 verse 9 says God is holy. Psalm Proverbs 30 and verse 5 says God is pure. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9 says God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 says God is the author of peace. Do we bring peace to the place where we go to, or do we bring strife? 2 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says God is true. And 1 John 4 verse 8 says God is love. God is love. Most of the descriptions we find about the character of God are relational. That is, they describe God in relationship to other people. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is a refuge and strength. God is my help and God is love. When I walk through those mountain passes, or of my statues, or waterfalls, or, or paintings. I can be deeply moved by what I see, but the mountains cannot respond back. The statue cannot respond back to me. A painting cannot love me because they cannot know me. Love can only take place in a relationship. Can, you cannot love in a vacuum. You cannot, cannot love in isolation. In other words, the character of God can only be revealed through our relationship to the people and our loving obedience to God's word. How are we doing, How are we doing? 
How are we doing in our relationships with other people? How are we doing in our, in our obedience to God's word? Because people watch you. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the express image of the Father. In other words, to reflect into Jesus, we need to become like Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 25, Jesus said that, that the disciples should be like the Master. And in John chapter 13 verses 34 to 35, uh, Jesus said, Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love each other. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Yet, loving like Jesus is impossible in our own nature. Because since the fall in the Garden of Eden, mankind has been self-centered, self-serving, self-interested, and self-loving. Focused on himself rather than others. As in Jeremiah 13, verse 23, which says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you do good that are accustomed to do evil. And Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we are sinners in need of God's loving forgiveness and redemption. And we shall remain in sin till Christ returns. But right now, at this time in history, we can only reflect the image of God by the supernatural intervention of God's Spirit through our lives. Amen. St. Corinthians 3 and verse 18, which we read at the beginning, says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Only the Spirit of God can bring about the necessary changes within us to reflect the character and image of Christ. Yet, yet God can do it right now. He can snap his fingers. And each one of us can be changed into his image and no problem at all. But yet, God will never take away our choice. Yeah, let's let's give, give an example. For example, um, anybody here is interior, could do interior design? Interior design. Sorry? Italian room wants to know. That's interior room design, isn't it? Okay, so there's nobody here for the interior design. No problem. Let's just say I now go out and advertise for a person to come to me who's a good at interior design. And this person comes to me and I say to her, I want you to remodel my home and I want you to actually make it looking good. And she says to me, what do you want me to do? And I say, do whatever. And so then she goes in, she spends my money, she redecorates the house, she remodels the house, does everything that she, that she wants to, and then I come along and say, oh, I don't like that. Mm. I don't like that. Mm. <laughs> Who's to blame? You. Exactly. Unless I told her what I wanted, I can't hold her to a cat unless she does what I want. So in other words, we need to give her a design specification. So as God showed Moses an image of the tabernacle before Moses could build it, so God shows us the image of Jesus. So we can channel our efforts into becoming like Jesus. If we want to see how Jesus related to others and why he did that and copied him, then we can faithfully reflect the image of God uh, the Holy Spirit is bringing about with us. Because remember, the Holy Spirit can be remodeling you. Right? He's very remodeling you. But if you have no image in which to actually channel that remodeling, you can do nothing like anything. Yeah? So we have to channel this image that we know into the image of Christ. So it's not just the Holy Spirit, but there is our faithfulness as well leading that. 
Let's look at Jesus for a moment. Let's look at the example of the Last Supper. In John chapter 13 and verse 3, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And he had the power to do something about it. You know, Jesus said, he called upon legions of angels, he called upon tens of thousands of angels to come and save him. But he didn't. And Jesus could have used his own power to protect himself, but he didn't. And Jesus could have destroyed those who opposed him, but he didn't. Instead, Jesus let his love show that all can see it and that he can save us. On the evening of the Last Supper, Peter denied Jesus. Yes, though Jesus knelt to the feet of Peter and washed his feet. On the evening of the Last Supper, Judas betrayed Jesus. In fact, John 13 verse 2 says, The devil had already prompted you, Judas to betray Jesus. Yet still, Jesus knelt at the feet of Judas and washed his feet. In other words, we are seeing the character of God in action in how Jesus related to those who denied him and betrayed him. Jesus demonstrates for us that in order to reflect the true image of God, we need to serve others and be reconciled to them if we have a problem with them. Even those who deny us or betray us or hurt us. Now, we can rationalise away, can't we? Why we act as an agreed victim when someone hurts us? But when Peter and Judas hurt Jesus, Jesus responded by washing their feet. From this we can say that if someone says something bad against us, we can take the stance of an agreed victim, or we can respond like Jesus. Even if someone hurts us, we can be take we can become the victim, or we can respond like Jesus. On the cross, Jesus, who was the greatest victim of them all, never sinned, never lied. No, did anything wrong. His purity and his holiness was an offence to those people around him, and so they killed him, they nailed him on the cross. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. <coughs> if we want to reflect the image of God, can we do anything less than forgive those who have hurt us and seek reconciliation with those who have opposed us? Excuse me. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That might sound a bit hard, but why should God forgive us if we're being hard hearted towards other people? Also, we cannot benefit from God's forgiveness. And so we've forgiven those who have either hurt us or done something bad against us. God wants us to reflect his image. And we can only do that in how we reflect his character in our lives to others. We can only do that through the supernatural presence and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It raises the question, to who, to who are we to reflect God's character? Do we reflect it to each other? Yes, that's possible we can do that, we can reflect God's character to each other. Uh, but it's more than that. We need to reflect God's character to our families, in our homes. We need to reflect God's character to people all around us, because the only image of God they may ever see could be the image of God that they see within us. Before becoming a Christian, give me an example. Before becoming a Christian, I've not seen Christians coming out of the church. And I just 
responded to some of the words which I spoke to them, and they dismissed me rather harshly. They dismissed me, didn't want to know me. They, they just wanted themselves and wanted to ignore me. So I thought they were quite nasty. And my thoughts were what were this. If that is what God is like, then I don't want to know God. So people will see God in others. We reveal God in how we live our lives. So when we go from door to door, or meet different people who we know uh, are not Christians, they know we might be Christians. We look at us to see what image of Christ they will see in us. Let me ask each one of you a question. How well are we reflecting the image of Christ to those people around us?